leaders must be close enough to relate to others, but far enough ahead to motivate them. And so I want to ask you about both sides of that coin. Uh, on, on the close enough to relate, can you first of all describe that? And then I want to try to get into your mind and ask honestly, like, is there such thing as too close? Can you share too yes, much? Yes. I, well, I, when you, that's a great question. When you talk about leading by example and being in front of them, but being close enough to relate to them, I always tell leaders, close comes first. Mm-hmm. Close comes first. I want friends. I don't want fans. Mm-hmm. And if I want friends, then I have to walk with them. And uh, and I want to walk with them. And so until I can make a um, a connection with you, and until you can know that my connection is sincere... I will impress you, but I won't impact you. We impact people close up. We impress people far away. And so I always tell leaders, start with close. And the reason you start with close is because young leaders aren't good enough to be far ahead yet. (laughs) In fact, fact, when I was a young leader, I wasn't ahead of anybody. Everybody was ahead of me. I was 22 years of age when I had my first leadership responsibility, and everybody in my group they were already ahead of me. So I never knew what it was. It took me a long time before I knew what it was like to be out front. But it didn't take a long time for me to connect with the people and know that I really cared. And so my leadership in the beginning was really a caring connection more than a competence connection. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, if you don't develop that competence and get far out in front of them, then after a while, they're going to say, I have a great friend, but I don't have a leader. Right. And I have a lot of wonderful friends. That I, I'm, just, I'm just not going to follow them. But I mean, they're just terrific friends. So I think the caring comes first because that's the heart. And, you know, people touch your heart before they ask for a hand. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think that comes first. And then, obviously, you've got to grow into your leadership. But if, if the people care for you and you care for them, they'll give you space. They'll give you time. They'll let you mess up. Uh, I mean, they're your ally. Again, I tell leaders all the time, the greatest thing you could have is have the people that you love, love you, and and always be there to help you. Imagine this. So imagine... I'm a, I'm a young leader or I'm, a, I'm starting my leadership and I care about people. And I've got a team of four, five, six, seven people and they know I care. And then I see more and I see before. And yes. so I get out ahead of them and we cast vision and we, and we grow together something special. Now I've got 70 people and then one day 700. How do you communicate care uh, to those people when, when there's too many? You may not even know all their names. Yes. Well, first of all, you know, Andy Stanley, our friend, says do for one what you wish you could do for many. Right. And I think that's a terrific principle in itself. But what I, what I have always felt is this. I think unconditional love can be for everyone. But I don't think you can give everyone equal time. Mm-hmm. And so I share with my people, you don't have to earn my love. I give that to you unconditionally. But you do have to earn my time. And so there is where I began to distinguish the people that I want to develop and that I want them to move further is by by saying, the way that I will give you that time is for you to show me that you are paying the price for it, that you're, that, that, that you're up for it. It's, it's, it's John Wooden who would tell his ballplayers, don't tell me what you're going to do, show me what you're going to do. Mm-hmm. And so, that, so the moment I start going out in front, it's basically who's going to show me they want to be out front with me. And, and, and if you come out front with me, then, then you're going to have a little bit more of, of, of my time. And so I think caring for people is for everyone, but I think as far as leading and developing people, that's for someone. I, I, I think not everyone wants that kind of development, and, and, and not everyone works for that kind of development. Mm-hmm. So I think you have to be real clear. It's kind of like upfront expectations. I think that's what's important in leadership is that when somebody comes to get in the game, before you put him in the game, you say, let's have just a good, honest conversation. For example, Mark Cole, who runs all of our companies, uh, one of the things I sat down with him years ago, and I said, there are a few things I want you to tell every person that joins our company. And, and one of those things, Craig, is we will have tough conversations. Mm-hmm. And I love telling them that when we hire them. Because when you hire them, they say, oh, whoopee, I got a job. Yay, we're in. You know, this, And it's kind of like a high watermark for them. And I love that. At that moment, I like to also say, while you're feeling good and while there's been no problems, there will be problems. Mm-hmm. And I just want you to understand right now. So that when we have that tough conversation, you'll say, well, he isn't picking on me or am I? No, no, no. 
This is this is the way this works here. And I just think that the upfront conversation, upfront conversations it, is my willingness to be close to you. Right. But it's also my ability to share with you that there is a leadership part of my life that is always going to uh, cause me to confront, to push, to pull, to, to prod. You know, I, in fact, I tell people all the time, the good ones, I say, I care enough for you to confront you. Yes. And, and I think we sometimes get a little Disneylandish on, on, on conf- confrontation. It's like, he doesn't like me. Uh, no, no, no. He, in fact, he likes you so much or she likes you so much, they're confronting you. No, I like that so much, too, because especially, you know, you're the leader of your organization. And if someone is close enough and cares about you enough, you make a mistake. The fact that they, they come and tell you oh. is, is a gift. It's it a is gift. a gift. And you, mm-hmm. you, know, you, is, you have to work really hard to help people confront up. And also some people are afraid to, to, you know, correct their team members. And so I think, like you said, if clarity is kind, if you can, if you can say, Hey, when I'm coaching you, it's because I believe in you. If I didn't believe in you or didn't like you, I wouldn't be coaching. And so this is actually an act of caring by saying, Hey, you can do this better. Or have you thought of it this way? Sure. And, and that is, that's another way of, of, of caring. I feel cared f- for by someone else when they do correct me, and help me become yeah, and, better. And, and I love you bringing that point out. And here's why, Craig. I think if I am not open for correction in my own life, then it's a very difficult thing for me to turn around and do it to others. Right. I, I think uh, teachability starts at the top. And uh, when I walk into a room, into any meeting as a founder, leader, it doesn't really matter. I can tell my team, and they know right off, the best idea when we walk out of here is the one's going to win. Mm-hmm. Not my idea, the best idea. And I think creating that kind of an environment is very healthy. I'm excited to hear your response to this quote. It's one of my favorite uh, quotes of yours. You say, you'll never change your life until you change what you do daily. Yes. The secret of your success is determined by your daily agenda. I'd love to know, um, what do you do daily that helps you uh, impact lives and build your organization the way you do? What are some of your daily disciplines that are most helpful? Well, I love that question. And, and I do believe this. I, I believe that we uh, we overestimate what we can do tomorrow. Right. And I think we over-exaggerate what we did yesterday. <laughs> and I think especially when you're old like me, you sit there and, you know, the good old days. So I, I don't think the good old days were always that good. You know what I mean? But I do think, and I, in fact, I know, we underestimate today. Mm-hmm. And it's the only moment I have. All, all I have is now. The only time I have. And, and that's why I tell people consistently, you have to live in the present. Mm-hmm. Uh, be there. Be, be present. Whatever, whatever you're doing, do it well right now. This last year, I had a great experience. I um, was able to play Augusta, this incredible golf course, with Lou Holtz, who uh, is known in the sports world as a very high, uh, very successful college football coach. And, and, and although the golf was great at, at Augusta, what was really great was the evening sessions after dinner back in the in the cabin. And and one night, I got on a conversation with Lou Holtz because he 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 coached six university teams, of which all six of them, when he took over as coach, had a losing record the year before. All six. And within two years of him being the coach, all six of those that had a losing record, he not only turned it around, but within two years of him coaching these teams, they were in some kind of a college bowl game. And I call that a U-turn leader. A U-turn leader is, uh, is they take something that's going down, and, and, and then they flatten it out. They, 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 they kill that negative momentum, and they get it going, and then they, they bring it back at the top, and they get positive momentum. That, that's, a, that's a U-turn turn kind of leader. And, and to do that kind of a thing, you have to create positive change. Remember this. You can't turn anything around without changing it. Nobody ever said, you know, I'll tell you why I was so successful. I took something that was not doing well and did nothing. I just did nothing. I just said, time will heal us. And 27 years later, we kind of turned around. No, 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 no. Let me, let me tell you something. Everything that's bad in your life will never be fixed until you change something about it. Everything bad in your organization will never be fixed until there is a change. You, 
Change is the indispensable link to turning things around, to, to testing and, and proving that you're a good leader. If, if you and I take over something that's doing well and has momentum, to be honest with you, we don't have to be a leader very well. We just almost have to just kind of carry the baton in front of the group and, and just kind of run ahead and stay ahead of the group. But, but when it's going wrong, when it's going down, it takes a, that, that's the test of a leader. What do you take that's not working, stop that negative momentum, and then turn it around and give it. If you, if you turn it around, it's always because you produced positive change within the organization. So let me give you three or four quickly change comments. Number one. People feel awkward and self-conscious uh, self when they have to make changes, when they're doing something new. It's, it's, it's just there's an awkwardness about that. We all feel awkward. And, and so whenever you're trying to create positive change, you're making people do something they don't want to do. I, I, I literally talked to a guy one time, and I was talking about changes in the organization. And he said, well, I know we've gone through some changes in the organization, but I just can't recall them right now. And I said to myself... You haven't gone through real changes in organization <laughs> because there's nothing but pain in those. You, don't, you, you remember them well. You, oh, my gosh, do you remember when we had to go? You, are you with me? Yes. So, so it's always awkward. Do me a favor. Uh, drop, your, drop your pen for a moment and just clasp your hands like this, would you please? That's just like this. Okay, you got it? Everybody got their hand clasped? That's really good. Now, let me tell you something about what you just did. You've done this thousands of times. Let me tell you what you've never done. Move your fingers over one and clasp them. Feel how awkward that is? You know why it's awkward? You've never clasped your hands like that until right now. You're comfortable doing things the same way. Fold your arms for me. Just fold your arms. That's beautiful. You've done it thousands of times. Now change the way you fold your arms. <laughs> Feel how awkward that is? You know why it's awkward? You've never done it that way before. Now, they're both folded arms. They're both clasped hands. They're both the same thing. But you've never done one, and so therefore it's uncomfortable to you. Here's what I know. Most people are more comfortable with old problems than they are with new solutions. That's what I know. So therefore... People want to stay in the old problems. If you're going to be a U-turn leader and create positive change, you're going to have to get them to cross their arms differently. You're going to have to get them to clasp their hands differently. The second thought on change is that people initially focus on what they're going to lose or give up when they have to do change. The first, when you ask people to change, the first thing they think about is not what they're going to receive, new and fresh and different and beautiful. They think about what they're going to have to give up. That's why they... they Dig in. The first question a person asks when there's change is, how's this going to affect me? What's this mean to me? What, this mean? What, 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 what am I going to have to do? What am I going to have to do in that process? Because I know these two things about change, I can still remember when I was 27 and I had to lead my first congregation through a multi-million dollar building program. And I was way over my head. And I can still remember spending days trying to figure out how do I take a congregation uh, that people vote on change, including multi-million dollar building programs, and as a 27-year-old kid, convince them to, 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 to build this big building and uh, millions of dollars. How do I do that? Uh, let's, call this, um, let's call this teaching, since I've never given it before, let, let's call this teaching the rule of five for leading. The rule of five for leading. And in a moment, I'm going to explain to you how the rule of five works, which is in itself tremendously life-changing. But what I'm going to do today is I'm going to, I, I sat down, I was up in San Francisco uh, doing some writing for the last two days on, on, a, on another book. And I sat down and I, I, I wrote this out. I wrote this out and, and I, I want to give this to you. So I want you to look at the person you're sitting beside and say, uh, John's never done this before, okay? He says, it's never done this before, okay? And, and tell that your neighbor, uh, and he's doing it for us because we're special, okay? We're special, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Okay. Be because, because again, if, if I want to have a relationship with this organization, your leaders and you, I, I, want, to, I want to come uh, fresh. I want to come uh, with, very, with, with, with teaching that really is where you're living and, and, and where you're going. And, and I know that you are the leaders of this organization, that, that, that as you go, the organization, the company goes. I know that. I know that. So, so let me, let me, I'm going to talk to you, let me talk to you a little bit about leadership. I wrote a book about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, called The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, okay? How, how many of you have that book? Would you raise your hand? Okay, okay, good, yeah. In fact, uh, let me do it one more time, and this time raise both hands so it'll look like twice as many. Uh, that, is, that is the, that's the best-selling leadership book ever written. It sold millions of copies. It sold over a million copies in China alone, where I go twice a year to teach and lecture. And the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, if you don't have it, you want to get it. Because that's, basic, that, that's absolutely the foundation for understanding leadership and how to lead and, and, and what you need to know to be a better leader. And for the teaching today, I'm going to, I'm going to take the first law, the law of the lid, L-I-D, and I'm going to teach the law of the lid for not long, three to five minutes, and then I'm going to teach the rule of five. And then I'm going to share with you five things that you need to do in the rule of five to, to lift your leadership lid to get and be a better leader. So, so let, me, let, let me just teach you the law of the lid. The law of the lid just simply says that your ability to lead will determine how well you succeed. In other words, the better you lead, the more you'll succeed. The better leader you are, the larger organization you can develop. The, larger, the better leader you are, the larger you're following, the larger, the greater your influence will be. The law of the lid is an amazing law, and it basically says that as you learn to lead, you will grow and be more successful. And the better that you lead, the more successful you will become. Now, for teaching purposes on the law of the lid, I want you to look up at me, and let me just give you a visual so that we, we can kind of make sure we got this, okay? If, if, let's say, for example, if this is my leadership lid, this is how well John Maxwell leads, okay? This is my lid. I, I don't go any higher than this lid. This is my leadership lid. This is how well I lead. And, and let's just say I'm an average leader. So it's a, it's a five. I'm a five. I'm, from a one to a ten, I'm a five leader. If that's the case, if this, is, if this is my leadership lid, this is how well I lead, what the law of the lid teaches is that my business, your business, what you do with Vasalis right now, your business will come under your leadership lid, but it will never get any better or go any higher or grow any farther than what your ability to lead is. So that your, your leadership lid literally determines the level of your success. So if I'm a four as a leader, what that means is that my business will be a four. Or if I'm a five as a leader, my business will be a four. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, now. Even in a great organization like this, my leadership lid will determine the level of my success. Now, when I begin to understand the leadership lid, and I begin to teach the leadership lid, all of a sudden everything began to change. Because you see, it was in 1974 that I came to the conclusion after studying successful people for five years from 69 to 74, after really looking and watching successful people, I came to the conclusion that everything rises and falls on leadership. And when I say everything rises and falls on leadership, you say, John, what do you mean everything rises and falls on leadership? What I mean is everything rises and falls on leadership. Now, what part of that don't you get? I didn't say some things. I didn't say most things. I didn't say 99% of the things. I said everything rises and falls on leadership. In fact, I know it. I believed it in 1974. I started studying leadership. I started teaching leadership. I started leading a long time ago. But now in 2013, I'm more convinced than every, that, that everything rises and falls on leadership. And one of the reasons I am is because I've developed the largest leadership training company in the world. We, we, we're in 174 countries. We've trained 6 million leaders. In fact, we are now training 1 million leaders every 10 months. And we're two years away from training a million leaders every six months. And by 2020, we'll train a million new leaders every month around the world. 
And so when the, yeah. so when the, when the United Nations asked me to do the opening assembly to all the ambassadors, they said, come in and talk about leadership. The reason they asked me to do that is because we teach leadership and in, 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 in two years we'll be in every country of the world teaching leadership. And I understand leadership. I know how to, I know how to train leaders. I know how to teach leaders. I understand leadership. It's, it's been my life. It's been my life for a long, long time. And, and in 74, I was convinced everything rises and falls on leadership. And can I tell you, 2013, I know, without any question, everything rises and falls on leadership. So how well I lead will determine how well I succeed. So this is huge. I, I've got to become a better leader. And the question people ask me all the time is, can I become a better leader? They'll, they'll ask me a question like, John, are leaders born? When they ask me, are leaders born, I always give them the same answer. Of course they are. Come on now, think of that question for a moment, huh? I've never met an unborn leader. Huh? Hey, don't particularly want to either, thank you very much. So when they ask me, are leaders born? I know what they're not really asking, are they born? What they're really asking is, are there some people when they're born, they got it? And some of you, when they're born, they don't got it. And if you got it, you go to the front of the line. If you don't got it, you go to the back of the line. That's what they're asking. And I've got great news for you. And I do believe, I have no question about it, that there are some people that are born with what I call leadership leanings. No doubt about that. Just like some people are born with kind of a musical leaning. No doubt. But the, the great news is, because I've done this for so long, and I've done this with so many over such a long period of time in every country of the world, what I know is you can learn to lead. You can learn to lead. You, you, can, you can learn to be a better leader than you are right now. You can, you can grow as a leader. In fact, look at the person you're sitting beside and say to them, even you can learn to lead. <laughs> wow. Isn't that amazing? You weren't sure about that person, were you, huh? You weren't, you weren't sure they could really learn, but now you got to figure, they, even they can learn to lead. Now, let's go back to, let's go back to this law. If I'm a five as a leader, that means my organization will be what? Talk to me, a four. Okay, here we go. Because the lid, the leadership lid won't allow it to go higher. So how do I grow my organization? This is very simple, folks. I, I, I've got to raise my lid, don't I? I I've got to get this lid up and, and, and because I can become a better leader, I can raise my lid, true? So I can go from a five to a six, to a seven, to an eight. To a nine. Now, this organization is a four. When that leadership lid starts going up, that organization goes from a four to a five, to a six, to a seven, to an eight. You see, your organization will grow to the size of your leadership ability. Now, if I were where you are and I was listening to what I just said, and I was taking notes somewhere on my notes or somewhere on my iPad, I'd be putting a star right here. I'd be putting a rocket ship. I, I would be putting a, a sign that says, do not miss this. Because your ability to lead will determine how successful you'll be in this house without any question. The best leaders will build the biggest business. No question. That should light a fire within you. That, that should spark, something should be going off on the inside right now. You see, everything rises and falls on leadership and I've got to raise my leadership lid and Maxwell says I can, that I can learn how to lead and the better I learn how to lead, the bigger I can build this business. There ought to be something inside of you that says something like this. I had better learn to lead. Hello, this is an IQ test. If you miss this one, you can go home now. Vicellus can't help you. God can't help you. You understand? The whole concept, the whole idea that you can learn to lead, and if you learn to lead, and the better you learn to lead, the more successful you can become, and the greater your business. This is an absolute fact. It's not a theory. It's not a thought. It's not an idea. It's not a principle. It's a fact. And the law of the lid says, the better you learn to lead, the higher you lift that lid, the greater your business can become. Now, that's the law of the lid. So the question that I have today, and as I was talking on the phone to your leaders the other day, 
The question I have is then, well, how do I lift that lid? How, how do I lift that lid? If, if that's the key, then John, come on, let's get that lid lifted. And by the way, you're in luck because I know how to do that. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I really do. I, really, I ain't bragging, just living it, okay? I know how to do that. In fact, look at your neighbor and say, John can help us. Go ahead and tell you. He, he, John, John can help us. And look at your neighbor and say, and you need John to help you. Okay. All right, okay. Now, now. John can help you. Trust me on this. I know how to lift the lid. Now, to help you lift the lid, let me teach you the rule of five. Now, the the rule of five I can teach for two hours, so understand, I'm going to try to do this in three minutes. But I can with you because you're smarter than these other organizations. You understand? Okay, all right, all right. With some, it's a, it's a weak conference. Okay. So, with some, a week doesn't matter. Still doesn't take. Okay. The rule of five is the most life-changing concept for focusing on success that I have ever taught, that I've ever lived. So I'm just gonna drop it on you just enough to help you understand the five concept, to help you understand the five things you need to do to lift your leadership lid. The rule of five just simply says, if you have a tree in your backyard that you wanna cut down, and you have an ax, if every day you pick up that ax and you go to that tree and you swing five times with that ax to hit that tree, put the ax down. The next day you go out, pick up the ax, swing five times at the tree. Put the ax down. The next day you go out, pick up the ax, and five more times you swing at that tree. Five times every day you pick up the ax, and only five, not 50, not 15, not 500. Five, if you swing five times a day at that tree with that ax every day, let me ask you a question. What eventually is going to happen to that tree? That tree is going to? Now, there's no question about that, is there? There's any doubt. You, you don't have to sit around the table and kind of say, do you think it will? Mm, let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya and hope. If you swing five times a day at that tree every day, that tree will fall in the story. Now, If it's a big tree, it may take a couple years. If it's a little tree in your backyard, I don't know, maybe maybe in a month you could knock that baby down. I I don't see. Now, now, the size of the tree will determine how long it takes for it to fall. But that's not what we're debating here. What we're teaching here is if you swing five times a day at that tree, every day the tree will fall. Now, that's the rule of five. The rule of five says, find your tree. What's your goal in life? What's your purpose? What do you want to accomplish? What do you want to knock down? Where's your ax? What are your tools? What, 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 what is it that you're going to use to, to effectively go after that goal five times a day? What, what are you, what is it? Because whatever that is, whatever that is, If you use it five times a day, every day, you'll be highly successful. For example, I write books. So let me just put that in writing for a moment. I've written 73 books. Uh, Jason, that was a nice introduction. It's 22 million, not 19. But what's two or three million? Give a little, take a little, little here, little there. People say, John, how, how, how have you written 73 books? Oh, thank you for asking. <laughs> the rule of five. You see, there are five things I do every day that allows me to write that many books. It's not magic. It's not that I'm brilliant. It's just that I know the rule of five. The rule of five. You see, every day I read, every day I file, every day I think, every day I ask questions, and every day I write, 
Every day, I do those five things every day. Every day I read, every day I, I file, every day I think, every day I ask questions, every day I write, every day I read, every day I think, every day I file, every day I ask questions, every day I write, every day I think, every day I read, every day I ask questions, every day I file, every day I write, every day I write, every day I read, every day I think, every day I file, every day I ask questions. Yes, I can do it in different orders, but every day. Doesn't matter whether you swing the ax left-handed or right-handed, you just gotta hit the tree. Every day I read. File, think, ask questions, write, read, think, file, ask questions, write, read, think, file, ask questions, write. You say, now, John, what do you mean by every day? <laughs> this is where it gets a little long sometimes. What I mean by every day is every day. <laughs> now, you say, now, now let me, when you say every day, do you mean, you, do you do that on Sunday? <laughs> every Sunday I read, think, file, ask questions, write. Do you do that on, on, on your birthday? Every birthday, guess what? Every birthday I read, think, file, ask questions, write. Do you do that on Christmas? Guess what I do every Christmas? Every Christmas I read, think, file, ask questions, write. Do you do this when you're not feeling well? Can I tell you when I'm not feeling well? <laughs> Even if I'm not feeling well, guess what I do every day? Every day I feel, when I'm not feeling well, I think, write, ask questions. Do all those things every day. You say every day? At the age of 17, I started filing. I've never missed a day. I don't have a hundred quotes. I don't have a thousand quotes. I have tens of thousands of quotes. I don't have a hundred stories. I don't have a thousand stories. I have 10,000 stories. Where did you get all those stories? Where'd you get all those quotes? Well, let me tell you something. Guess what I do every day? <laughs> see, see, we, overestimate what we can do in a day and we underestimate what we can do in several days. And you gotta understand, you gotta understand, the secret of success is not the fact that, hey, I, I didn't say, hey, some days I get up and I write for 12 hours. And, uh, no, 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 I, I didn't say I write, all, I write all day. I didn't say I read all day, I didn't say I think all day, I didn't say I ask questions all day, I just said every day, every day, you see, Doing a little bit every day is a lot more important than doing a lot someday. And most people live in someday. Well, I'll tell you what, I think I'll get to that. You know what, I think I'll try that. You know what, I believe I got. Now, now, here's the key. You gotta figure out what the five are. It took me seven years to find my five for writing. You say, man, John, you're slow. I am. It won't take you seven years. But it'll take you a long period of time. I could get the first two quickly, but the third, the fourth, the fifth, it took me four years to get the last one. Now, forget writing. Because this isn't about writing a book. This is about leading. And what I'm gonna do is I sat up in my hotel in San Francisco and I wrote out what I think is the rule of five for leading. And I'm gonna give it to you. And I've never given it to anybody else. You're the first ones to get it. So look at your neighbor and say, we're the first ones. Go ahead and tell him. We're the first ones. We're the first ones. Okay. You got it? We're the first ones. Okay. Hey, and since you're the first ones, don't blow it. You understand? Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to give you, if you can do these five things, the rule of five for leading, you will lift your leadership lift. How many of you want to lift your leadership lift? That's right. Okay, okay, uh, the, these five things we're gonna give, give them to you. And by the way, they're all simple. They're all simple. You can do all five. You can do all five. They're simple. Think about my rules uh, for writing. Every day I read. You can read, can't you? Every day I think, every day I file. Every day I, no, 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 see, the things, that, the things that will bring you success are not complicated, they're simple. I'm a communicator, not an educator. Now I have an education, I got three degrees, but I'm, I'm, I'm not an educator. An educator takes something simple and makes it complicated. <laughs> yeah, my father was a university president for 17 years. I know university stuff really well. A, a, an educator, they just take something simple and make it complicated. If you're not confused, they're not happy. <laughs> a communicator takes something complicated and makes it simple. I'm a communicator, my name's John. I'm your friend, I'm a communicator, and I know how to communicate. I know how to put the cookies on the lower shelf. Yeah. 
Might as well have some. I've been having some. I know how to put the cookies on the and you what I'm going to share with you about leading you can do this but you can't do this in a day and you can't do this in a week and you can't even do this in a month you can't do this in a year this is a lifetime of living this rule of five are you with me yes. it's a lifetime so there's no quick fixes here there's no magic but you can do this okay let me give you the first one the first of the rule of five for lifting your leadership lid is lead yourself. Lead yourself. Now, now you say, John, when you say lead myself, what do you mean? What I mean is lead yourself. You see, when we think of leadership, we always think of someone else, don't we? We think, okay, 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 I gotta, I'm gonna rule, that's rule of five for leading, lifting my leadership lid. All right, I gotta go find some people, gotta find some people, okay. Find some people, find some people. No, no, no. Before you lead someone else, you need to lead yourself. I was, I was at a, a leadership conference, been speaking all day, doing Q&A the last session, a kid with an MBA stood up, he said, John, I love your leadership principles. My goodness, he said, ah, I'm sitting here all day. He said, I'm an MBA student. I'm still in school. I, I don't even graduate till this spring. And he said, I, I kept listening to you and I kept thinking, boy, I wish I had somebody to lead. I wish I had somebody to lead. I wish I had somebody to lead. I, I wish I had a company. I wish I had a, I wish I had a department. I wish I had somebody to lead. He said, I don't have anybody to lead. He said, where should I start? He said, good question. Start with you. Let me put it this way. If you wouldn't follow yourself, why should anyone else follow you? So what do I mean? I'm talking about leading by example. I'm talking about having the leadership qualities within you that you want to teach someone else. Having the leadership values within you that you want to impart to someone else. I'm talking about visually leading people because leadership is visual. It's a visual responsibility and it's a visual act. Nobody has ever said to you, I am following a great leader, I just have never found him or known him. No, you're taking drugs. <laughs> Every person that you've ever followed, you saw. Every person that you ever said, I want to follow, that person has had an influence on you. And listen to me very carefully because the most important motivational principle in leadership life is this. People do what people see. So when they follow you as a leader, it's not what you say to them that makes you effective, it's what they see in you. Let's go to the 21 laws of leadership for just a moment. The 21 laws of leadership. The law of magnetism. The law of magnetism simply says we attract who we are, not who we want. Oh my, that is so good. No wonder that book has done so well. It'll change your life. We attract who we are, not who we want. I run into people all the time and they come to me and they say, John, I, I'm developing a group. I, I, I'm starting an organization here, and, I, and I, I'm getting people to buy in. And, and John, oh, I, I'm all excited. And I look up and say, what kind of people do you want to be attracted to your, to your organization? What, what kind of people do you want to bring in? What kind of people do you want to recruit? And they'll say, you know what, I want, I want people with um, 
Energy. Oh, I want energy. I, I like energy is important. I want people with energy. And I'll tell you what else I want. I want, uh, I want people with a character. I want, I want somebody who has some integrity uh, and, yeah, and, and, and an attitude. Oh, I want somebody who has a good attitude. You know, oh, okay. And, and they start listing all these qualities they look for. And I'll let them list three, four, five. It doesn't matter. But when they get to five, I stop. I say, wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Okay, you want somebody with energy. Yeah. Uh, you want somebody with character. Yeah. I, well, I want somebody with good attitude. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I, stop, 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 stop. I don't care what you want. I got a question to ask you. Do you have energy? Do you have character? Do you have a great attitude? You see, if you have energy, a character, and a great attitude, guess what you attract? Birds of a feather. See, like begins. Like, like attracts like. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Before you ask somebody to follow you, make sure you have your own act together. You see, too many leaders, they're like travel agents. They send people where they've never been themselves. <laughs> my name's John. And I'm your friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're travel agents. They've never been there themselves, but, but they're always sending other people there. They've never experienced it. They've never lived it. They've never fleshed it out. They're not living it. They're just, they're, they get up and they think, I'll just cast a vision. I'll just cast a vision. Boy, I'll just say, all right, here's the great way. People don't want to follow your finger. They want to follow you. Quit pointing, quit talking, talk's cheap. Any person that hasn't succeeded can talk. We teach what we know, but we reproduce what we are. Oh yeah. It's brilliant. <laughs> when you've done this for 40 plus years, it's brilliant. It's not that I'm brilliant, it's just that I've done it so long. After a while, I catch on. <laughs> we teach what we know, but we reproduce what we are. So if you're wanting to raise up some great leaders in your group, guess what? The first thing you need to do is be a great leader. Oh, oh let, let me explain that to you. Let, let me just sit down for just a moment. At my age, it's a highlight. <laughs> let me just sit down for a moment and let's go back to the law of the lid. Remember when, when your lid was a five, what was your company going to be? It was going to be a... Absolutely. The lid says you can't have a six. You can't have a seven. You can't have an eight. You can't have a nine. You're a five leader. A five leader doesn't have sevens. A five leader doesn't have eight companies. Five leader doesn't have nine. Five leaders have four companies. What kind of a person will you attract? If you're a five leader, you don't attract sixes. Sevens, eights, nines, tens. Can I tell you something? Eights don't want to follow fives. Eights go meet a five and they say, whoops, Mr. Magoo. Oh. So how do you attract better people? Lift your lid. If you're a five, you get fours, threes, twos, and ones. If you're a six, you get five, fours, threes, two. If you're a seven, you get six. If you're an eight, you got this? Stanford Research says, just came from there. Stanford Research says that 85% of everything you know, you learn visually. 85%. The reason I say that the first rule of five in leadership is leading yourself is because visual 
example is the most powerful leadership tool, axe, axe, to cut down your tree. Trust me with that. James Allen, James Allen said, people are anxious to improve their circumstances, but they're not anxious to improve themselves. And they therefore remain bound. The first person that you should teach leadership values to is you. The first person that should flesh out leadership is you. The first person that makes the decision to go forward is you. Lead yourself. I will promise you, start there. Start small. Start with you. When I was 25, I made a very important leadership decision that literally has changed my life. When I was 25, I made a decision that as a teacher, I would never teach something that I didn't 100% believe. And what that meant was I did a lot of things, I had a lot of subjects I didn't teach on. Are you with me? But I realized that the power, the life change, the passion, all comes out of living it yourself. And once you start living it yourself, it is so amazing how people will begin to follow you. So don't leave this conference and go back and say, oh, let me tell you what I learned. No, no, don't tell them what you learned. Show them what you learned. My mentor for many, many years, John Wooden, used to say to me, John, I would look at my players at UCLA and I would say to my players, don't tell me what you're going to do. Show me what you're going to do. Number one on the rule of five for lifting your leadership lid is lead yourself. You got that one, don't you, huh? I can tell you got it. You are the smartest crowd I've talked to today. <laughs> are you ready for the second rule of five? And by the way, every day, what do you, what do, you do? Every day I what? Lead myself. You got it. Every day I lead myself. Number two, the second of the five is every day add value to people. Every day. Every day add value to people. When I was 27 in Dayton, Ohio, I listened to Zig Ziglar, my wonderful friend who passed away about a month ago. What a precious... When you talk about somebody living his message, Zig lived his message. I knew him well, played golf with him, been on trips with him. We've spent a lot of time together. What he said is what he lived. What a great, great man. And I remember Zig in that wonderful Mississippi draws. He'd walked around the stage in Dayton, Ohio, and he said what you have heard too. If you'll help other people get what they want, they'll help you get what you want. And that day my life was changed because as a young leader, I wasn't helping people get what they want. I was asking people to help me get what I wanted. I was saying, hey, listen to my vision. Look, here's where I'm going. Hey, look at my train. Hey, get on my train. Hey, let's go on my trip. Let's go on my journey. Hey, let me tell And I was trying to get people to come my way. And that day everything changed when he, he, he basically said to me, John, leaders focus on others first. They focus on what are your dreams and what would you like to accomplish and what do you love? And what's your passion? It changed my life. And from that time on, I said, okay, I'm going to be a person that every day adds value. And, and can I tell you, I, I have a practice I've done for 35, 40 years. I did it this morning. Woke up in my hotel and I thought of you and I thought that I'm going to be able to teach you today and I'm going to be able to spend some time with you. And I, and I began to think about how can I add value to you? And I, I took my notes and, that I had written yesterday and I, I went through them again and I looked at them. I said, okay, what, where can I help them? What can I do that will really lift them? How, how can I add value? See, every morning, every morning I ask myself, who can I add value to and how can I add value to them? Every morning. And every evening I ask myself, did I add value to that person and how did I do it? 
Every morning, who can I add value to and how can I do it every night? Did I add value to that person and how did I do it? Every morning, who can I add value to and how can I do it every night? Who did I add value to and how did I do it? It's amazing because I teach leadership is influence and people come to me all the time. They say, okay, John, how do I increase my influence? Because the more people that you influence, the more people you're going to have in your business. No doubt about it. It's very simple. People that know how to add value to people continually increase value and influence with people. So because I'm so passionate about adding value to people on a daily basis, remember every day, every day, hey, every day I lead myself. Every day I add value to people. Every day I take that ax, lead myself, add value to people. Because I'm so passionate about it. I sat down a few years ago and I asked myself, okay, how do I add value to people? And I came up with three things that I want to pass on to you quickly. I add value to people, number one, when I value people. You got to value people, friend. You got to really love people. Don't be like Charlie Brown one time who said, you know, I love, I love mankind as people I can't stand. You got to value people. You see, if I don't value you, I'll take advantage of you. Leaders who get in trouble get in trouble because they stopped valuing the people that they lead. So I've got to value people. Number two, I have to know and relate to what you value. I have to know and relate to what you value, and I can only do that by listening. I can only do that by by instead of talking and casting vision, turning to you and finding out where you are and how you feel, listening, oh my goodness, the great leaders, the great leaders, they listen, they learn, and then they lead. They listen, they learn, and they lead, they listen, they learn, and they lead, they listen, they learn, and they lead, they listen, they learn, and they lead. If I wanna add value to you, I have to value you. I have to know and relate to what you value. And number three, I have to make myself more valuable. If I'm really gonna add value to you, guess what I have to do? I have to keep getting better, don't I? Because if I don't keep growing and if I don't keep getting better, it's impossible for you to keep growing and it's impossible for you to get better. And you see, in this business, you gotta keep learning. You gotta keep growing. I watch people in this type of work and they get to a level and they just kind of plateau and they get satisfied and they stop growing and they just kind of live off the level they're on and live off the land. You, listen, the only way that you can be valuable to somebody tomorrow is learn something new today. When's the last time you learned something for the first time? This whole process of learning and growing and developing. But every day, add value people. So when I was in the San Francisco airport getting ready to get on the plane this morning, the lady behind the counter, when I got me an iced tea to drink, I asked her how her day was going and she started talking about her three children and how she was going to get, leave work as soon as she could to help them get into school. And I listened to her for a moment and smiled and told her I thought she was a good mama paid $1.50 for my iced tea and gave her a $20 tip. Listen to me, I want to tell you something. When leaders stop valuing people, they should stop leading people. This is not, hey, this business is a people business. It's a people business. And the caring and the loving and the valuing people is the core of longevity and success in leadership. I wish I had time to go on, but I, I, I've got to give you the other, uh, the other three. Okay, the rule of five for lifting your lid. Every day I lead myself, right? Every day, what do I do? Secondly, add value to people. Number three, every day I study leadership. 
every day. And you say, now, John, when you say every day you study leadership, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is every day. <laughs> How are we doing, gang? <laughs> every day I study leadership. You see, again, back in the 70s, I heard Earl Nightingale say these words. If you will take one hour a day, every day, for five years on a certain subject, and every day for one hour, we'll study that subject for five years. In five years, you'll become an expert on that subject. And that was in the middle 1970s, and I said, I think I'm going to do that. I think until 1980, I'm going to spend an hour every day just studying leadership. I'm going to, I'm going to read leadership books, and I, I'm just going to, I'm going to get around leaders. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to study leadership, and by 1980, I'll, I'll be a great leader. And, and I did that every day until 1980. And by 1980, I thought, oh, my goodness, this works so good. I think I'll do it until 1985. And, and so every day, I did an hour of studying leadership until 1985, and I thought, oh, my gosh, I know so much more in 1985 than I knew in 1980. I think I'll wait and go on to 1990. And and said, then I went for every day to 1990. I thought, man, I'm writing leadership books and they're buying those suckers and life is good. I, I think I'll do this every day. 90, what have I done? I, can I tell you what I do every day? <sighs> every day. <coughs> My staff, any book with the title of leadership in it, I get it. I every day read leadership. Oh my goodness, every day. <laughs> and because I have so much reading to do, I took three speed reading courses. Oh yes. So when I interviewed Condoleezza Rice on the plane out, I, I read a book on Condoleezza Rice. I can read a book real fast, you understand. I took speed reading courses so I could read more. Now, speed reading didn't increase my comprehension, but speed reading lets me get to where I need to get to so I can slow down so I can understand it. <laughs> you see, 20% of a book has 80% of everything you need to know. Now, there are some exceptions, my books, for example. <laughs> So when I say study leadership, what do I mean? Write real quick, okay? I gotta get this done for you. That means reading. That means resources. You, you, you see, in 1973, when I realized I needed to develop a personal plan for growth and I didn't have one, and I didn't know how to develop one, Success Motivation Institute out of Waco, Texas had a, had a kit that I could buy for $795 that would help me to personally grow, and that kit cost me one month of my salary. And I bought it. Well, it took me six months to buy it, because I had to save up for it. Most of my life, I have belonged to at least seven CD clubs on leadership. Resources. Learning lunches. Every month since 1982, I've set up a lunch from somebody. I buy the lunch, I don't even eat. I just ask questions. Somebody that's smarter, faster, better than me. And I just ask questions. I call it my learning lunch. I do it every month. Oh, I wish I, if I had 20 minutes, I'd teach you what I just learned. Oh, I, just, I would just teach you what I, I just learned in a learning a lunch I had two weeks ago. But I don't have time. <laughs> events. Going to events. Leadership events. I started, Margaret and I started visiting presidential libraries because I love history and I love leadership. I've now been to every presidential library in America and studied it. I, I, I just constantly immerse myself in leadership events. I've already talked to you about filing. I file every day leadership thoughts, quotes. If I pulled out my iPhone right now, I could, just, I could, give, you, I could give you three dozen quotes that I've pick, picked up in the last two or three days that I filed, and I just keep them in there, and I just keep reading them. I keep working, and I just keep reading them until I've got them, until they're mine. Study leadership. 
I, I, I do hope. I, I do hope I'm lighting a fire for you because I'm telling you, your leadership lid will determine how high you're going to go in this business, and I'm going to promise you, you can't increase your leadership without studying leadership. So every day I lead myself. Every day I add value to others. Every day I study leadership. Are you with me? Yes. Number four, every day I practice leadership. I practice leadership every day. I not only study leadership, but I, I, I practice leadership. I shared with you about my organization, Equip. The largest leadership training organization in the world. You say, John, how did you, inf and by the way, we did that in 16 years. How, how did you develop the largest leadership training organization in the world? It's very simple. When we train leaders, we go in for two days and we have a leadership workbook and we take them through the leadership principles. And then at the end of the two days, we give them 10 workbooks. And we said, we'll be back in six months for the next session. In the six months we're gone, you take 10 people and you train them what we trained you to do. And they can't come back for their second training until they validate that they've trained 10. You see, a long time ago I learned, I'm not about to train somebody how to lead that isn't going to practice leadership. You see, I'm telling you, you can waste a lot of time with people who like to have meetings. But their biggest accomplishment is lighting the fire and doing a little kumbaya. The whole idea of not only knowing how to lead, but practicing your leadership. Malcolm Gladwell, who's a wonderful friend of mine, read some great books, Tipping Point, et cetera. Malcolm is the first guy to say that if you want to be highly successful in doing something, you have to do it at least 10,000 times. Mm -hmm. He gives examples, the Beatles, the whole, all, all these groups that made it big, when people say, oh my, they just made it big, they'd just done it, done it, done it, done it, done it, done it. Practice, 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 practice. I, uh, that, that when, when Malcolm said that, I, I, I said, I wonder how many times I've spoken. So I, I went back and had my people do research and I've spoken over 12,000 times. So people say, John, you walk out on stage, you take your water, you stick a cough drop in your mouth, you sit on a chair and say, my name is John, I'm your friend. <laughs> you don't look nervous. You're, it's like you're having a conversation with us. Well, I'm having a conversation with you. Absolutely, and I'm not nervous. I'm not nervous. I've done this 12,000 times. You say, oh, John, you look so natural when you do that. Of course I'm natural. I've done this 12,000 times. Oh, I wish you could have seen me in the beginning. I was nervous. I wasn't natural. Practice. Oh, yes. I was over at Jack Nicholas's house one afternoon. We were doing some putting in his green in his backyard. And I said, Jack, I've watched you make all kind of pressure putts to win major championships. Did you feel the pressure? And he smiled and said, not really. How could, you, how could you have such an important putt and not have the pressure? He said, well, you have to understand when I had that seven-foot putt, had a little break to the right. He said, to be honest with you, I've done that putt about 10,000 times. And then he said, practice gives confidence. Thank you, Jack. The rule of five says you've got to practice leadership. Oh, I wish I had time. Okay, okay. I don't have time, so I'm going on, because the last one's important. But before I give you the last one, I, we got to review the fir first four, okay? Get your axe out, gang. Get your axe out. We got four things to do. You got your axe? Come on. We got a tree here, huh? We got a tree. Okay, okay. Well, when I pick up that axe, my first swing, the first thing I do is, a, 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 in my rule of five, every day I? Ah, uh, yeah, I pick up that axe, and the second thing I do every day I? Absolutely, and I pick up that ax, and the third thing I do is every day I, and that's right, and I pick up that ax, and the fourth thing I do every day is, oh, you are so stinking good. Every day, number five, I intentionally grow. Every day. Every day I intentionally grow grow. Oh my goodness. 
every day. I intentionally grow. This is huge. If you'll just hang with me. Can you, can you give me, can, give me, if you'll just give me, can I have five, if I have five more minutes, okay? Five more minutes, okay, okay, okay. No, I, I, there are other things on the program, and I, and I don't, I, I, so I, I'm not wanting to disrespect anybody or the program, so if you could just, okay, okay. So just, this is important right here. This is important because every day I intentionally grow. Are you with me? Yes. This, hey, I, in 1977, I wrote this. It's laminated. Yeah, it's my prized possession. Because I wasn't in a growth environment. I wasn't lucky like you. I didn't belong to an organization named by Silas. I didn't belong to an organization that is an amazing organization that's breaking all kinds of records. I didn't get to go on the rocket ride. I wasn't on a ride. I was on a donkey. And that ass wasn't going anywhere. My organization's theme song was, I shall not be moved. And they weren't. And all of a sudden I decided I wanted to be a success, but I didn't have, I didn't have peers like you to help me be successful. I didn't have leaders like you have to help me be successful. I didn't have an organization like you have to be successful. I didn't have strategy like you and, and training like you to be successful. I didn't have any of that. And, and so I'm a kid and I said, I want to be successful. And I, and I knew that I had to create a growth environment and I wasn't in a growth environment. And so how do I create a growth environment when you aren't in a growth environment? The people that I was with, their idea of progress was moving backwards slowly. So I wrote this down in the late 70s, and it's still true today. Here's what I think a growth environment is. A growth environment is a place where others are ahead of me. In other words, I wanna be around people that are better than me. I wanna be around people that are more successful than me. I wanna be around people that are faster than me. And that's exactly what you have in this organization. You got, you got some pace setters, don't you, huh? You got some amazing, amazing pace setters. Let, let me just put it this way. When you're at the head of the class, you're in the wrong class. That's good, isn't it? Yeah, it is. What do you say? It's just good. My name's John. I'm your friend. A growth environment is a place where I am continually challenged. I'm continually challenged. I mean, every day I get up, I got another hill to climb. I, I'm, not, I'm not looking for the hammock. I'm looking for the hill. A growth environment is a place where my focus is forward. It's right out in front of me. It's not behind me. It's not the good old days. It's not yesterday. A growth environment is a place where the atmosphere is affirming, where the people around me, they're encouraging me. Encouragement is the oxygen of the soul. A growth environment is a place where I am out of my comfort zone. In other words, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm taking virgin territory. I'm going places where I've never been before, and I'm not one bit comfortable. I'm nervous, and I'm excited, and I, I'm stretching, and I'm praying, and I'm holding on, and I'm just, oh, oh, help me, help me, help me. Help me, Rhonda. Help, help me, Rhonda. Help, help. I, I'm over my head. Are you with me? And can I tell you something? You want to be over your head. You want to be over your head. You don't want to be in the wading pool of life with ankle deep water. Get over your head. And by the way, when you're over your head, it doesn't matter how deep the water is. You're over your head. A growth environment is a place where I wake up excited. Man, I know a lot of people, they don't even wake up. We're supposed to leave our footprints in the sands of time, but a lot of people, they're just leaving their butt prints. Yeah, they just got butt prints in the sands of time. They're not doing anything. You with me, huh? Hello, come on, talk to me. There are some people, they're already dead. They just haven't made it official yet. Yeah. A growth environment is a place where failure is not my enemy. It's not my enemy. Failure is my friend. Oh, yes. 
I write three books at a time. This one's not out yet, but I've written it. It comes out next year. I love the title. Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. It's good, isn't it? That's yeah, good. It really is. A growth environment is a place where others are growing. Mm hmm Some of you, I've seen some people, they win the race, but it was because no one else was running. I won, I won. Oh, where is everybody? Oh, I won, I won, I won. A growth environment is a place where people desire change. They want something different. They want something fresh. A growth environment is a place where growth is modeled, where growth is expected. Now, what am I saying? That fifth rule, that fifth, number five, and that rule of five on, on, on learning to lead and, and lifting your lid is all about intentional growth. I'm gonna to jump to the end and ask a question because it ties to what you just said, but then I have a question for the middle of, of what he was teaching on. So if you're, if you're listening to your throne, like that was the end of what he said. But at the very end, John talked about in order to prepare and process correctly, he needs to pull away from things. And he listed, I don't know, six, six things that he needed to pull away from. And at the very end, uh, he, talked, or he talked about occasional high performance um, versus consistent high performance and then paying the price every day. Now, if you guys are like me and you're like a type A person and you hear that, the first thing that I think of in all transparency is I think that sounds overwhelming because I'm already all systems go in so many things. So now if I have to can think of myself as like bringing high performance to everything I do, but let's not forget the very first thing that he said is what is good to do versus what is best. So he's, there are a ton of good things to do that come at us every single day and having the discipline and understanding of what is the best, what is the best. It's a lot of good stuff. That's one of the biggest learning lessons for me as a leader is learning that there are a lot of good things that I have to say no to in order to do the best and to bring my high performance consistently every day that it needs to be, you know, just to the things that are the best things or else I'm kind of going to waste my time. Like John will say, I do three things well. And I have a team around me who is great at all the things I'm not great at, but he works really hard to do those things, three things well. And so I think it's freeing and not something not to miss that we aren't just supposed to bring high performance to every single thing we do in the day, but really to the things where we need that where we'll get the most return. And yep. Am I saying that clearly? I mean, I know that's a lesson John always speaks to us. Well, I, I love that you brought this up because what we do is we mystify success. Yeah. We put a mystique to, to high performers. We look at John mm -hmm. Maxwell on stage and we go, wow, that guy's incredible. I bet you it's awesome to talk to him at four in the morning. I've talked <laughs> to him at four in the morning. And most of the time, four in the morning is not this great orator that is communicating this beautiful, memorable message. It is, Mark, why can't we get X, Y, Z done? Now, right. I say that because we mystify the performance. We put a mystique on the performance mm -hmm. and don't realize that John is the same guy that says you need to be consistent in high performance. He's the same guy that teaches you can't be 100% all day, every day on That's everything. Right. Yes. And so John is not speaking in paradoxes there. We take a point that should be meant to improve our consistent aspiration of high performance. And we, we deep, we make it, we, we make, we cause it to lose credibility because we think we got to do that all day long. Yeah. And it, it overwhelms us. Tracy, I've been around you. We've traveled the world together as co-board members in John's nonprofit and you supporting John and I through all the different things that you do. You are a high performer consistently. And so I'm glad you brought this up because if you, knowing you like I know you, are sitting here hearing John teach that today and go, man, I'll never measure up to high consistent performance then yeah. certainly there are others in our podcast family that's feeling the same way. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to challenge you. Don't try to win the championship in one day. Mm -hmm. Tracy, I'm going to take us back to the very beginning of what John said, because he said, winners value the process of winning. 
hold that thought because I'm going to come back to it and I'm going to teach for a moment. Winners value the process of winning. Value the process of becoming a consistent high performer without the burden of becoming that overnight. If you got impacted by something John said today, wake up tomorrow and be a little bit more consistent in your pursuit of high performance rather than waking up tomorrow discouraged because you failed at X, Y, or Z. Right. Going back to the point of winners value the process of winning. Value the process of improvement. Uh, I am an Atlanta, I am an Atlanta, Georgia native. There's not many of us. What that, I love sports. What being an Atlanta, Georgia native and loving sports means is there are 99.9 seasons of every sport in our city that I'm disappointed. 99.9%. But today, December, the last podcast of December, I can say right now that the Atlanta Braves are the world <laughs> champions. Oh, yeah. I know that was about two months ago, but forgive me. I'm still living in the glory <laughs> of being world champions. But let, listen to this. Listen to this. I'm thinking as we record this podcast, I'm thinking of the interviews with our coach and with a couple of our champion performers right after the World Series. And I don't know if any of you stayed up East Coast past midnight to hear the interviews, but I did. I, I missed that <laughs> boy again because I was reveling in the moment. You know what every one of them said, Tracy? They were like, man, we were awesome tonight. Oh my, the sweetest thing about tonight is the win tonight. No, it was six games into the World Series. It didn't take a seven, but it took a six. It wasn't the fact that we finished it in six rather than seven. You know what every one of them said? The sweetest thing about this victory is in August, we were not even a 500 winning percentage team. Mm -hmm. The Atlanta Braves of 2021 that are the world champions were the latest team to ever get to 500. In other words, just as many wins as losses in the history of the World Series. We were the latest. And what they said is, the most sweet thing about this is we couldn't even play 500 ball in August. And in two months, we turned it around and became world champions. You know what wow. they were saying? We love the process mm -hmm. more than the win tonight. That's right. We love the fact that we were bad, but now are good, better than we love the great experience of championship. Mm. Guys, winning is a habit. You know what the most favorite part of this Subject title should be for all of us, the word habit, not the mm -hmm. word winning. Mm -hmm. But most of us want to focus on the word winning as if it is the formula. Mm -hmm. The formula is not winning. The formula is habits that take you to winning. That's the secret sauce. That's amazing. And they had a lot, you know, winning the World Series. That's beautiful. And congratulations to all you brave Thank fans. Thank you. I'll take it. Thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> but it really is winning is not necessarily winning the the end it's it's all the wins along the way the successes that you find along the way so that you enjoy the process and so if some of you are thinking like man I'm, I have some bad habits I gra I quickly grabbed while I was listening to John I grabbed off my shelf this today book today matters and John referenced it but I want to encourage those of you if you don't have it get this book if you do have it go pull it off your shelf and it's like, this, this is what it'll look like on your bookshelf, red and white. And so for those of you who are watching us, um, right. but in the first page, before he even gets to, to chapter one, he says, just for today. And he makes a list of 20 things, maybe, and 20 things to do. So if you're like, I'm not really sure how to create healthy habits. I've just been one of these people who like Tracy goes, tries to go a hundred at everything. And then I realized I don't need to go a hundred at everything. You know, Mark talked about when we travel for transformation to these countries and, you know, we are with the people and, and you're all giving a hundred percent. And then you get back on the bus and you go to the next event. And on the bus, we're all very kind of well, John is talking and teaching always, but in that moment, we're kind of quieting ourselves because we don't need to be at a hundred when we're on the bus. And so there's those moments in the day where you can give yourself permission that you don't need to bring a hundred, except for those moments where 
it really is going to bring the biggest return. So if you're looking for a launch pad for that or to try to wrap your head around those habits that Mark talked about, open up Today Matters and look at just for today the list that he put there, which I think is so powerful. He, there's this quote, Albert Einstein says, try not to become a man or woman of success, rather become a man or woman of value. Yeah. And that's not at the day where you win the World Series. That's every time are you a person of value, every time you show up where it's going to bring the biggest return, which he then goes on. It kind of leads me to the next one. Are you okay if I ask another, another oh, question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So he talked about when he decided whether he was going to be a winged speaker and this, oh, sorry if that was on my microphone, pierced my heart because I, uh, I know that there were times as a sp young speaker that I winged it. I called it in because I knew I had charisma. I knew I knew my topic. I could teach it like that. If somebody said, hey, Tracy, can you stand up here and talk, talk on this? I knew that I could do that. But this, there came a time where the first time I ever heard John say this, it was very convicting to me because I think I was relying on my natural gifts rather than developing my gifts. So I want to ask our podcast audience, number one, what are you winging that you need to put a little bit more preparation into to knock it out of the park, to to really honor the moment where you get to influence other people. What are you winging that you need to put more time into and take away time from something that's less of value, but really where your sweet spot is that you need to not wing, but really prepare for. So you just kill it. And then my second question is for you, Mark. And I'm just curious, what are you tempted to wing in the day? And, and how do you keep yourself from, from relying on your natural gifts and talents? Cause you have many. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, I love this question. I love how you highlighted it. Um, it because, and I love how you challenged our podcast listeners to identify where they're winging it. You know, I, I want to say one thing on it before I answer the question. And that is most of the time we wing where we are naturally gifted. In other words, John is one of the greatest connectors I've ever met. Now, what I really mean by that, he's one of the greatest communicators I've ever heard. But he doesn't see communicating as getting a message across. He sees communicating as connecting with the audience. Mm -hmm. That's why I call him the greatest connector I've ever met. He connects with people from stage better than I've ever met. What John was saying is years ago, he could have winged it because he's so good at it. Yet he decided he wanted to be excellent with it. Right. So most of us struggle with the winging it syndrome on the things that we really have to be, we have the opportunity to be unforgettable with. Mm. See, you won't be unforgettable by just being good. You will be unforgettable when you are better than anybody else. John's good because he decided he wasn't going to settle with being great at a natural gifting. He decided he was going to go to the next level of greatness by being unforgettable. Mm -hmm. Back to your question, which is probably true for most of us podcast listeners. I am, I wing it with relationships. I'm a relational person. I'm naturally gifted to be relational, but I have found that if I rely on relationships, the higher the level and competence of relationships around me, the least effective I am because I was not intentional with that. And so I'm convicted with your question to go most often whether it's a leadership moment with my team, whether it's a moment to communicate with a president or prime minister of a country, I don't always spend a lot of prep time on relationally connecting with people, doing a little biographical research, finding out what they like, what they don't like, because I don't need all that information to connect with people. Mm. Yet if I spent time to get to know their interests coupled with my natural gifting, I would be unforgettable. But I'm not unforgettable sometimes relationally just because I'm good. I'm only unforgettable when I take good and make it exceptional mm -hmm. and unforgettable. The way a relational person, i.e. me, becomes unforgettable is when I bring my natural talents with my preparation and I create unforgettable moments. 
And I'm not doing that extremely well before you ask me that very pointed question in front of tens of thousands of people, Tracy. So thank you very much for the conviction. Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results 